So please do be seated as we turn to our main Bible reading. <clears throat> Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at these four verses uh, from Hebrews chapter 1, page 1201 in the church Bibles. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's bow our heads before our great and glorious God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we pray that those wonderful words we've sung will be a reality in our own hearts and lives this morning as we turn to you, the living God, and that you would speak to us through your word, that we may encounter the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so leave this place having a greater vision of him, a greater trust in him, and a greater love for him, for your name's sake. Amen. Well, please do be seated. And uh, do turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. One of the most popular Christmas carols of all time, which rounds off our carol service here at St. John's every year, is the classic, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, with the immortal lines, Veiled in flesh... The Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Great words, but what do they actually mean? And why do they matter? Well, what they mean, as strange and as seemingly implausible as they may sound to some, is that the Creator became a creature without ceasing to be the Creator. Why they matter is because upon them rests our eternal destiny and the future of the entire universe. Now, this is the way C.S. Lewis summarized the situation in his day, which is not that dissimilar to our own day. He says, is not the popular idea of Christianity simply this, that Jesus was a great moral teacher, and that if only we took his advice we might be able to establish a better social order and avoid another war. It is quite true that if we took Christ's advice, we should soon be living in a happier world. You need not even go as far as Christ. If we all did what Plato or Aristotle or Confucius told us, we should get on a great deal better. And so what? We have never have followed the advice of great teachers. Why are we more likely to start now? But as soon as you look at the real Christian writings, you'll find that they're talking about something quite different from this popular religion. They say that Christ is the Son of God. They say that those who give Him their confidence can also become sons of God. And they say that His death saved us from our sins. Now, putting it bluntly, if Jesus is not God, who became man while still remaining God, then Christians are guilty of idolatry by worshiping a man. In which case, the complaint of the Muslim is upheld. You Christians, you're idolaters. If Jesus is no more than a man, 
but simply to be placed on the same level as Socrates or Buddha, then we needn't give his words any more weight than any other man. But if he is God, then everything changes. For then we can say with certainty, we know what God is like, and we know what God wants from us, and we know what God wants to give us. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at one of those Christian writings that C.S. Lewis talks about, which expresses in the most sublime way imaginable, defying the imagination, and which is meant to lead us to grateful devotion and genuine discipleship. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Now, although we don't know who wrote this letter, we do know what he was, namely a preacher. All the evidence is that this is one long sermon. So you do quite well at St. John's. According to chapter 13, verse 22, it says this is a short homily. So goodness knows what a long sermon would be. And in fact, verses 1 to 4 is one long sentence in the original. And it is packed with theological dynamite. His writing style is not like any other writer in the New Testament. It is very highly polished. In fact, some say that he is the Shakespeare of New Testament writers. He is top quality. But it is not how he writes which is especially impressive, but what he writes. Just look at verses 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now, as any marriage counselor will tell you, most problems in relationships come down to a failure to communicate. He never listens to me. She doesn't understand me. It's as if we're from different planets, if not different galaxies. Effective communication is essential to fostering good relationships between people. Now, if that is the case at the human level, how much more so at the divine human level between God and people? So here are the two big questions. If there's a God, how do we know? And if there's a God, how can we know him? And for both questions to be answered positively, some kind of communication has got to take place, and the initiative must come from God's side. If he's there, then he must make himself known. And the word used to describe this activity of God making himself known is revelation. It's a word which in the biblical languages means a pulling back of the curtain so that we know who, what or who is behind the curtain. And here our writer tells us that God has done just that in two very special ways. It is, uh, I think, very funny film, Love and Death, the American comedian Woody Allen at once, one point says in exasperation, if God would only speak to me just once, if he would only cough, if I could just see a miracle, if I could just see a burning bush or a seas part, or my Uncle Sasha pick up a bill. Now what you have there is a mixture of universal human longing and entrenched modern cynicism. People want some assurance there's a God. But then come the conditions. Alan wants God the conversationalist, if only God would speak. But he has spoken. Maybe not in the way some people want, but he has spoken nonetheless. God has spoken through the cross but Alan would prefer a cough. Alan wants God the conjurer. If only I could see a miracle. 
But then he dismisses a book which is full of miracles. And you get the impression, don't you, that no matter what conditions are laid down for God to meet, further conditions are going to be waiting down the line. And in every case, God is expected to jump through the hoops of our making at our bidding. Not so the real God. However, that is not to say that he is not exceedingly gracious and kind in the way he stoops down to speak to us. He takes into account our, our frailties. And so God of the universe speaks in ways we can understand using common human language. He makes allowance for our rebellion too whereby more often than not, we don't want to understand what he's saying. Like Uncle Sasha turning a deaf ear so that someone else picks up the bill at the restaurant. But here we're told that God has always been the speaking God. In the past, God spoke. A better rendering would be God speaking in the past and now speaking through his son. It's one long continuous event. It's not that God has been silent. It is that sin shrouds our planet in silence and makes us deaf to God and blind to his works. From the very beginning, God made us uniquely to know him. And since the initial rebellion in Eden, he has steadily been unfolding a plan of rescue that, the, that would save the world that was lost. And this passage, this, these two verses, are setting us up for the fact that God began the conversation that is Jesus Christ long before the actual incarnation, which we celebrate at Christmas. You see, this is special revelation he's talking about. That is revelation which is given to specific people at specific times with specific content. Now, the Bible makes it very plain that the primary way God has chosen to relate to us is the same way we relate to each other as I'm doing now, through words. Think about how the very first book in the Bible begins, the book of Genesis. Establishing the pattern for the rest of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be, and there was. The Jewish philosopher Martin Buber tells the story of a rabbi whose reading of the Scriptures never got beyond Genesis 1, verse 2. And God said, some rabbi, the marvel of a God who speaks and whose word was the heart of who he is was too much for that rabbi to contemplate. He who is Lord not only lives, he speaks. Did you know that the expression, thus saith the Lord, appears over 3,000 times in the Old Testament? And when God achieved the greatest communication coup ever, bridging the infinite gulf by becoming one of us in Jesus Christ, we're told the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It's all about the Word, you see, God who speaks. Now, this goes right against our culture, doesn't it? It is contrary to much pagan religion, in fact. We live in an age of the visual. A picture is worth a thousand words is taken as a truism. Seeing is believing is more than a cliche. It's pretty well basic to the way most people operate. Well, there's only one time in history when the sight of God, as it were, and the sound of God came together, and that is in Jesus Christ, God's Son. So that as we look at Him, we see the works and words of God in perfect harmony. But apart from that one moment, the emphasis is undecidedly upon verbal communication, God speaking. 
Even the prophetic visions were always accompanied by verbal interpretation. Now just think for a moment of the difference between seeing and listening, and you can understand why God stresses the listening. First of all, sight is largely intentional, whereas hearing is voluntary. Take sight. We open our eyes, we can close them. We can turn our heads or we can turn away. In other words, we are the ones who are in control. Not so with sound. It comes to us and we receive it immediately. We are the ones that dress whether we like it or not. In other words, the speaker is mainly in control, not the listener. In the second place, sight is mainly to do with appearance, whereas words are to do with meaning. For example, imagine you go to Tesco's, and you see uh, down in one of the aisles uh, a man hammering away on the chest of another man on the floor. What do you do? Well, he looks like an attacker, so you call the police. But then you realize you should have called an ambulance because the man explains that the fellow lying on the floors had a seizure and is trying to revive him. That is, the words give meaning to the actions. And so it is with God. He gives meaning to life. Why we're here. What is the best way is meant, we're meant to live. He speaks. And it is our duty. In fact, more than that, it is our delight to listen to the speaking God. So the question is, how does God speak? Well, here in Hebrews 1, a contrast is set up for us. In the past, we're told, God's revelation was fragmented, but now it is fully formed. The writer says God spoke at many times and in various ways. A better translation would be, in many pieces and in many ways God was speaking. Or if you like, there's been a drip feeding of revelation over the years. Let me explain. Through words and actions, God has gradually built up a wonderful picture of himself, what he's like, how we're to relate to him. And that record of that self-revelation is contained here in the first part of the Bible, what is called the Old Testament. Now, I'm sure you've uh, seen these kind of photomosaic puzzles of a face. And when you look more closely, you s discover that each piece is a picture in itself. Here we've got Yoda. Well, when we turn to the Bible, what we find in the Old Testament is something like that. The jigsaw is slowly pieced together with little pictures until eventually we see the full face of God in Jesus Christ, the big picture. And as we look at his life, as we listen to his words, all the little pictures in the Old Testament of God are found there too, perfectly formed in Jesus. Okay, take it off now. Now, as we're going to see next week for the Jews, the question was never, what is God? That's a philosopher's question. And usually you get a philosopher's answer. You know, God is the prime mover or whatever that might mean. The Bible's question is this, who is God? And two things about God stand out from every other religion. Namely that this one God was the creator and ruler of all things and the redeemer of all things. That is who God is. So you find statements which spell these out like Isaiah 40. To whom will you compare me? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He's the creator. See, the Lord comes with sovereign power. He's the ruler. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Her sin has been paid for. He's the redeemer. And all sorts of pictures were given by the prophets, like Moses and others, gradually over a period of time in bits and bobs, showing us what God is like. He's a shepherd, he's a king, he's a father, he's a lover. 
But also we're given people and practices, priests who offer sacrifices because God is righteous, a temple in which to offer them, a king to rule over the people and so on. And so the fragments of the jigsaw puzzle come slowly together until eventually the picture is complete with the coming of Jesus. But in these last days, he is spoken or he speaks to us by his son. And where do we find out what Jesus is like and what he said? In the very same scriptures. The second half of the Bible, which completes the first, the New Testament. Now, sometimes people say, I don't worship the Bible, the written word. I worship Jesus, the living word. I, I, don't want, to know a, I want to know a person, not a proposition. I don't want an exposition. I want an experience. Have you heard those kind of things said? But when you think about it, they're all false options. How can you know Jesus other than by learning about him here in the Scripture? The Jesus of faith is really the Jesus of history. It's all written here. We have no access to him other than by this book. Isn't it also the case that the words of a person reflect what the person is like? So if someone makes promises and keeps them, we know they're a reliable person. If they issue warnings and consequences, we know they're a moral person. If they offer words of, of love and comfort, we know they're a caring, a caring person. And that seems to me a pretty good summary of the God of the Bible, isn't it? And we've also got to get it in our minds that words aren't just about conveying information, getting things across. They're also about action, getting things done. And this is very important. So let me explain a bit more carefully. If I say, or rather, when I say to my wife, <laughs> I love you, I am not just imparting some interesting piece of information to her about the state of my glands, okay? She'd be, no, no, be pleased to know that. By saying, I love you, I'm fostering love. I'm sharing, showing care. I'm building her up. I'm strengthening in the relationship through those words. Not only words, of course, but words are vital to enhancing our relationship. Well, that is what God has done through this amazing book, which is why Christians call it the Word of God. This is where I hear God's voice clearly. This is where I, I discover His will. This is where I learn His ways. This is where I get to know His person, His kindness, and receive His comfort. Where else can I go? One time, Bishop of Oxford, who was influential, actually, in the conversion of T. Lawrence, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, when he was a young man, was Christopher Chavas. And he wrote these words, which I've always found very helpful. Let me share them with you. He says, The Bible is the portrait of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospels are the figure itself in the portrait. The Old Testament is the background leading up to the divine figure, pointing towards it, and absolutely necessary to its composition as a whole. The epistles serve as the dress and accoutrements of the figure, explaining it and describing it. Then while by our Bible reading, we study the portrait as a great whole, the miracle happens. The figure comes to life. And stepping down from the canvas of the written word, the everlasting Christ of the Emmaus story becomes himself our Bible teacher to interpret to us in all of Scripture, the things concerning himself. When you turn to these wonderful pages and see Jesus, isn't he entrancingly beautiful? Isn't his wisdom 
surprisingly delightful? Isn't his compassion movingly inspirational? The Bible from the beginning to the end is about God and so about Jesus who is God. His character, his dealings with us, fallen and failing though we are, so we can come to know him and increasingly become like him. We are created to be and enjoy God as he's meant to be enjoyed. Does God speak through this book enabling people to encounter his son? He most certainly does. And there are umpteen people here this morning who will testify to that. But let me tell you about the Irish, former Irish UVF terrorist, David Hamilton, who spoke at one of our evangelistic events here a few years ago. Listen to this. <clears throat> he says, The police raided my house in the early hours of the morning, and I was arrested. When I went to court, I received a total of 44 years. On the day that I was sentenced, my mother called into my uncle's house on her way home to tell him the news. My mother was crying and said, you know, there's no hope for my son because he's just caught up in this violence. And even if he was out of prison, he would be involved again. He's just a hopeless case. But there was an old lady sitting there, 83 years of age. She said to my mother, that's not true. God can change your son. My mother just smiled and thanked her. She did not really believe there was much chance of that happening. But this old lady was able to tell my mother that she would pray for me every day that God would change my heart. Fourteen months later, I was sitting in my prison cell. There was a Christian tract on my bed. I remember thinking it was disgusting, and so I took it and screwed it up and threw it in the bin. I went, to child, uh, I went to church as a child. Prison was bad, but church was worse. I sat on my bed drinking tea, and there came a thought at the back of my mind to become a Christian. This is terrible. Someone's put dope in my tea. Why am I thinking like this? And I remember looking up at the shelf and seeing a Bible. I thought, even if I wanted to become a Christian, God would say, not you, you're too bad. It's only for nice people and good people. I lifted down the Bible and started to read some of the verses out of the fly pages. Then God showed me something I'd never seen before. He showed me he'd kept me alive. The IRA had tried to kill me several times. I thought, why should God not be interested in me if he's kept me alive? The next day I decided, I said, God, I know you're real. But if you're interested in me, take away the violence and the bitterness I have and change me. I prayed that prayer on my knees. I asked the Lord Jesus to save me. God changed me that day. I began to read the Word of God, and I can honestly say my life has changed. After that, I led IRA men to the Lord, sex offenders to the Lord, and many other men too. God showed me grace in my life. In these last days, you see, God has spoken to us by his son. And you know what? He continues to speak by his son. Let us pray. Lord, again, we marvel at the truth that you are the speaking God. You tenderly stoop down to whisper into our hearts through your word so we can know you and we can experience what David Hamilton experienced, that we will know you as our creator, as our ruler, indeed, as our father. And Lord, we pray that as we turn to your word day by day, 
you would transform us. And Lord, make us the people you want us to be. For Jesus' sake, amen.